Okay, thanks. Wow, I'm really kind of surprised there's this many people. Um, I'm going to start off with a warning for those of you who are thinking that you might be able to like attack other people using what I'm going to talk about. I have yet to figure out a black hat method, a uh, black hat use for this, because if you already own the IDSs, it's too late. You know, you can get everything, and I'm only looking for the good things. Um, what I'm talking on is passive auditing. We encountered a problem where I work where we have so many users that it was, became really difficult to find out what they're doing because nobody wanted to run like a client or something, so we couldn't see what activity they were doing, you know, were they patching, stuff like this. So we started developing signatures actually that actually kind of takes that out and actually eliminates the need for us to actually run a client on the end users. And so that's what I'm going to talk about here is what the signatures are, the sort of things you can find out in signatures just if, by watching the network passively. So of course, brief introduction, why you need to audit. It identifies assets, so you, that when you get your alerts going through, you know, if it's an, a, an attack on IES, do you really care if it hit an Apache box? An inventory of what you have, where you have it, you know, all that other good stuff. The state of auditing today, basically it relies a lot on active scanning. It uses a heavy usage of clients, so you need to have a client on that end machine. You, you connect to that client, you know, it runs the scan, tells you what's on the box. And it's difficult or impossible in a decentralized environment. I work at a major university. We have about we have three class B addresses and about a dozen class C's. You know, it becomes really kind of difficult in that environment, especially since most of them don't like us. Um, what, I'm, what we're doing with passive auditing is we're using packets on the network, stuff that they're doing anyways, to find out what their patch levels are, whether they're um, doing antivirus software, whether they're updating at all, um, what OSs they're doing. It does not affect in-system logging. That's one of the great things about it is because we get a lot of complaints every time we do try to scan because they complain like, ad nauseum about the amount of logs they get. My feeling is tough, but okay. Also, we get to take advantage of all those black hat scans that are coming through. When you're in a university, you frequently don't have firewalls or you have very limited use of firewalls. So I can find out what ports are open without ever touching the box because the traffic goes across my sensors. I've got it. Um, it aids policy enforcement. Some people like policies, some people don't. Um, ultimately, what it comes down to is event correlation. And that's where it becomes a real pain in the ass. And when you're looking at that many hosts, you know, if you f want to keep track of what their patch level is, that's, you know, every patch has its own little line in that database correlated to IP address or MAC. If you can get access to the ARP cache, it's a lot easier. So these are things that we can monitor passively, OS. Um, OS updates, whether we're getting antivirus and firewalls and spyware updates. Network services, are they using telnet, FTP, whatever. Open ports. Service versions, network application versions, that's mostly, that's more banner grabbing, though if you really get into it, there are ways of telling without actually grabbing banners, and policies. The downsides of this is, well, it's labor intensive, it takes up a lot of disk space, it takes a lot of time to build a big pic uh, the big picture that you need, because you will not get it in the first week. In fact, you probably won't get it in the first couple months. You have to start really accumulating data before you know what's happening. It takes a lot of data. It requires a commitment of time and money, and that's not always something that works out well. You know, if everybody's saying, well, we need to know this data now, go buy a scanner, hope that you get to the firewalls. Um, if you are willing to actually take the time, you'll get a better picture, well, you'll get a different picture than if you do scanning. It can be bypassed. If people manually download stuff to one machine and they, co and they copy off that patch, I'm not going to see it. Though you can't bypass all this stuff. You go back to that OS stuff, as long as they want to talk on the network, I can find out what they've got. It actually benefits from an ugly network. It's one of those few places that not having firewalls really helps, because I can see so much traffic. So I'm going to start with some rules. I wanted to jump right into the rules because I've only got 20 minutes here. So here's a, a basic snort rule. Try to keep these all nice and easy, very little like stuff done with um, and bin hex, uh, I'm sorry, in hex. I'm just looking at the strings here, with a couple exceptions. So this first one, it looks for people actually updating antivirus and information. Antivirus actually and firewalls, because that's with the semantic corporate edition. You notice here you see the user agent. User agents are your friend if you want to do this. 
because they really come in handy. Everybody wants to advertise what they've got. Well, this is where you get them in handy. So you capture on this. You capture on that user agent. You can capture on the host, because they actually, semantic sends everything to one place. Not everybody does that, so you have to watch that. Then right down here, that last line, you have the threshold, type limit, track. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the type limit, track by source, so each source IP address. Count one, so we only we're looking for we only need one packet here to find out this is working, and we only record this every on that one 180, 180 seconds, um, sorry 1800 seconds. The reason I had to do this with this particular rule is that it, it will go and do that get so many times for so many different things. So it's filling up logs. All I need to know is they did it. I don't need to know how many times they did it. And this is what the sort of traffic you get out of this is. If you notice in that um, when you get down to the data. Um, that's, it tells you right in that line what they're updating. Semantic, antivirus, corporate, client, NT, 9.0, English, so it's language, you know, you have everything there. So by that, you know, those 20s are going to, of course, going to be the space characters. That's what they're using there. So another, pa another rule. This is an OS update. We're looking for a specific Windows update here. I wrote a rule that just looks for the KB article. If you actually really quick, they actually release the article numbers before they release the patches, but you had to know where to find them on Microsoft site. I didn't include that in the slide, which I should have. Um, and so you can get a slight jump. Now, actually, I really recommend using generic rules that will catch everything and post processing. I'm really big on post processing, it speeds up the whole process from a machine point. And so what we're looking for is has that string, it says the get space, and that's the slash character. For some reason, for some reason, well, this is me, I like using hex in those points. And you give a depth of five, so this has to be in the first five hex decimal, the first five characters coming from that host in the TCP field, in the level. So then you're looking for the knowledge base article, and you want this line to end off with the exe, basically the, the get, this is the whole get string. These are elements out of it. One of these days, I'm going to get around to rewriting these in PCRE so they have the pro-compatible regular expressions, make the whole line a little easier to read. However, there's a penalty hit there, and I haven't quite figured out if it's going to be something I can keep up with. So out of this, we then find out it's a Windows ME host, because it's right there in that string that it actually downloaded. So you say MS download, update, version, capital. You get down there, it's Windows ME, knowledge base article. And this is also an English box. So this is all the stuff you see in their files that you're, they're downloading from Microsoft. Also, this progressive download there, that's the user agent for ME, for their, when you do the automatic update through them. Next rule, Windows malicious software removal tool, their new anti-spyware stuff. Again, this is a rule using similar functionality as the last one. Right now we're going with the Windows, the Microsoft bits for the agent. That is the normal XP2000 agent that you're going to see, and this is what you see here. You see this packet come through. Um, for this one, I actually, just in case anybody's curious, um, this one was TCP show I used to grab these packets out. I've also written some scripts for just extracting text from um, TCP dump files, UP caps. So you have, you find out this is Windows. It doesn't really spy, specify which one. The knowledge base article, name of the program and everything, again, English. Now this is where it starts getting a little more fun. Now with Red Hat, you seem to see a lot of people using their automatic update, the up-to-date stuff. This one is just checking in. It's saying, you know, are there any updates available? This really has answered questions about OSs also. Because all of a sudden, you don't know just that it's a Linux box, you know uh, it's Red Hat. So you get this whole string. The header info file is the one that actually says, what is the differences between now at what I have and what is available. So you're going to see this one anytime it checks in, whether it gets a download or not. So you, this actually allows you to actually map out who is trying to be a good network citizen. And here's what you get. But if you look at the get string on this one, you see the pub, Fedora, Linux, Core 3, so you know they're running Core 3. And i386, so you now see, you have an idea of the architecture. Though there's a better one for that one in the next right up. And you see they're using the Red Hat applet. Now you can actually rewrite these so that um, you can download and check anything. There's a, you got to draw a line here. Where is the privacy? You don't want to actually be capturing everything they do. But you also have to say, you know, this is the information we need to know to protect the network. 
And that is the biggest problem we've had, is actually where do you draw that line? Now this one, this is another update. I'm looking for the, that was, actually I rewrote this one early this morning, I messed up. Um, it's not a check-in anymore. You're actually looking for the actual downloading of the update. Well, when you get into this one, hold it. What happened to my slide here? Crap. Okay, well, I'll tell you what that one did download. It actually saw the kernel. And when you see the kernel goes by, you get to see the architecture at a different level. You get to see it was i686. You get to see the language. You get to see the specific kernel version. So once you, po you take this stuff out, you post process it, you can actually find out a lot of stuff in that one kernel, uh, in that one get request about the box. Actually, I'm going a lot faster than I thought I would. Um, so I should include more rules. So this is the check-in again. Okay, now this is where it gets a little more obscure. This top one here, all this path and all this um, snort signature does is it catches one sin for each host every half hour. It just tapes a p dump file, a pcap dump of this stuff. I use this one actually to map OSs because I can take this the pcap file, post process it through p0f, and all of a sudden you have a list of every IP address and what it's talking and what the OS is. Now there are, I have this every half hour. You will start encountering problems when you get to VMware or they're running NAT boxes. This is where that ARP cache comes in. Using that ARP cache, if you have access to the ARP table, you can say at this point, was it the same, ARC, the same MAC address as the one that was there before? So you can say, if, this, if it's two different MAC addresses, it's probably two different machines. However, if you have the same MAC address, you're now looking at VMware or NATing. If you go over and look at that up the MAC address, you can probably tell if it is a Linksys um, little router or if it is actually you know, a Dell, so a Dell box, in which case you know it's VMware. So it's actually all about collecting so much data that you can actually then make logical choices about what's happening on the net, about the host themselves. The second one here is the ability to actually map what services they're doing. This one actually uses banner grabbing. There's also some signatures for doing like what versions of SSH they're running. And when you actually get down to versions, that becomes really important because you actually can say, hey, there's a vulnerable version here. And you can actually notify people, say, you know, you need to fix this. You never had to scan the box. You didn't, you just watched them doing their traffic on their own. So in that one, you're catching, you're looking for basically the server return field from the server. So this is one of the places where you can start mapping out what's happening on your host that aren't them doing things, it's people coming into them. So this here, we're looking at Microsoft IIS 5.1. That version actually only exists in XP. So you know that they're running XP also. This can be spoofed, of course, with Apache. You can compile it with any browser, with any server. You can actually compile this stuff in and change it. I say any, and that's actually an overstatement. But the idea is that you, the people who are really trying to do that stuff, these are people who are good admins anyways, and I'm not worried about them. I'm worried about the, the idiot who runs their box, you know, they've, they have never patched it, they just put it up on the network, and five minutes later, you know, it's a warehouse box and it's attacking 30 million other hosts. That's, that's my issue. I don't have, a, I don't care about the person who's actually sitting there doing their job. It's all the ones that aren't doing the job that I'm trying to find with this. This also gets by, the biggest problem that we had on campus really was dealing with um, firewalls. Windows XP2, SP2 came out, every, all these firewalls, all of a sudden we can't get into these boxes with the scanners we do have. If you want to write a rule that will allow an IP address to talk to a box like that, you actually end up writing 65,535 TCP rules, 65,535 UDP rules, because they don't actually allow you to set an IP, a trusted IP. Microsoft's firewall does not have that concept. It's trusted ports, trusted programs, that's it. This way, we don't have to worry about that. We actually see the patching. We don't have to do the vulnerabilities yet. Scanning is still great. Scanning will help you a lot. It will answer questions faster than this will. But in the long run, you get a different picture here. Because if you look at those, like, the user agent stuff, you can see, are they running Kazaa? Are they using, you know, Outlook? You can see all this stuff by looking at the traffic that comes out of this box. Things that you will never see. You can't tell what browser somebody's using by a scanner. You know, are they running a three-year-old version of um, IE? I got a break-in yesterday, actually two days ago, on campus. They were running a version of IE that had a flaw in it that was fixed two years ago. Now, all of a sudden, they've got 
whole batch of extra stuff on their computer they didn't know about. Um, this I can tell, I mean, by, ban by actually watching the get request that comes out of that box. You know, how they request things because that's also in there. I mean, when you say you're going to get the, you know, download this, I go back a couple screens, that's where you, let's see, a user agent comes in because the user agent is trying, it's not, not required. You don't see this in Debian. When it does patching, it doesn't do this. Um, actually, I didn't include all my, I have a lot of signatures for this. I didn't include all of them, but I have patches for SUSE. Debian, um, Mandrake, you know, all these things. The, these are all available out there. The information is available. The hardest one I actually had to come up with was the one for Solaris. Because if you look at like Solaris 10, this automatic update feature it encrypts the whole channel. However, when you look at an SSL certificate, when you do that key exchange at the beginning and it sends what the certificate is, there's a place in there where it says who bought the license. And what machine it goes on? Well, it just so happens that Sun, that machine is um, like Sun Update. That you know, it's like Solaris Update. That Sun dot com or something like that. So you find that string, you know what's happening. You know they're now being a good network citizen. You don't know what patches they grabbed. And I'm sorry that I haven't figured out a way to get around the SSL. And if anybody has any ideas, come and talk to me. You know, we got a lot of other things we can do with that one. Um, <laughs> I won't have to go back to work on Monday. Um, so I can't get around that one, but I can help, you know, give you an idea of who is actually helping on the network, who's being good. Got a question? What was that? Yeah, using, using statistic analysis, you actually could do that. There's a program I'm going to mention at the end. It's a different IDS system called Bro. Um, it's kind of a, I refer to it as a bastard stepchild out of LBNL, but actually they love it and they use it a lot. It is a, written by Vern Paxton and it does some great um, anomaly detection, but it also keeps a connection log that says this IP address on this port talked to this IP on this port. This is how much traffic went by and this is what time it happened and how long it took. Using that, you can go back and do the statistical analysis and actually get a good idea of did they download one patch or did they update the whole system? I really didn't think I'd go through this this fast. Um, so on to here. So these are the tools that I use for doing this. Snort. I'm a big Snort fan. It's easy. You can really get into it and it's really par fairly powerful if you get into it. P0F. You know that OS fingerprinting that I do? I post processing it through there. It helps a lot. Make sure you do have one of the latest versions because the one I first installed, it didn't give me a timestamp. It just kind of said relative to when I started running P0F didn't really help me identify when you have to go back to that art table to figure it out, you need that timestamp. So make sure you have the latest one. TCP dump. I use TCP dump for everything. I'm sure everybody here does. Got a question? Yeah? Actually, our network group on campus, they actually have a database uh, that they keep of it. They um, dump the ARP cache from every switch and every router on campus every 15 minutes. So we go back to the database. Um, what was that? Too, much, too many years of punk concerts, I'm really going <laughs> to... Do I have a suggestion? Um, fortunately, I don't. Um, it's just not something I've had to encounter yet, and I haven't had to figure out how to do it. Um, yes. Oh, okay. Um, TCP show and ngrep. Those are tools that actually will help you pull out those strings. Now, actually, TCP show um, has one flaw in that it doesn't give you an accurate time. It actually doesn't dump the time in a format that I could use well. And ngrep does that, however, it core dumped on large files. So I wrote my own. Um, it really is just a simple Perl script. If you think about it, you pull out the Perl, you um, actually, if you wrap the, the um, you do the, cap, the minus lowercase x with TCP dump, it gives you that whole binary, it gives you the hex actually. Well, you can just process through it, measure out, okay, this is the IP header, this is the TCP header, and now you want the data after that. 
So actually on the website that I'll give you, I have that script. It's a re really actually a very simple script. Um, and so I use, that's where I go back to, I use TCB dump more than anything else. And Perl. Perl's great. Now I mentioned that Bro IDS. Um, if you are interested in that, it's a really great IDS system. Awesome anomaly detection. Really kind of hard to use though. I mean, be prepared. But it's bro -ids bro -ids .org. Um It is a really good one. It's just, and it will never compile into Windows, so don't even try if you're running ID Windows. A lot of custom scripts. You, just really, you really have to be able to write your own programs to do this stuff, at least for now. I'm hoping that eventually I'll get enough of them that I can just hand them off to people and say, hey, use this. But for now, no, you're going to want to write some of your own. I have some example scripts that I use, so if you want them, they'll be on the website. They should be on your CD, though I've updated all of them, so go to the website. Um, and a database. At the end of the day, you are going to need a database more than you're going to need anything else that I talk about. Because if you figure that Microsoft has released about 35 major patches this year already, those are the major, the MS-05, they've already released like 35, and this is actually kind of a slow year for them, and you look at like 40,000 hosts, and then you look at all the antivirus programs, and then you look at all the OSs they're running, you need a database. <laughs> I mean, I've been doing it actually for a while with ngrep. <laughs> uh, well, not, sorry, not ngrep, um, fgrep. Uh, so I just grep about flat files, and we're building the database now. I had to prove that it could be done before they built, and then somebody would take the time to build a database for me. Um, so at the end of the day, though, you are going to need a database to do this. So I'm going to say thank you for coming. Got an address there. If you go to www.passiveaudit.org, you'll see all the scripts I have, all the signatures. And I really would like to actually have more people writing signatures than just me. I, I do this at home at like 3 o'clock in the morning. So um, help. <laughs> this is how I, ha and when I have time, I do this because I find it fun. I'm kind of curious how far can I go? Can I actually, you know, I can actually find out if they've got office and stuff, but how much can I learn about the, ho about the computer? I don't want to let anybody think that I'm actually trying to learn out stuff about the people. That would be wrong. At least I would on campus. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll be outside if anybody wants to get questions or wants to volunteer. All right. Thank you. We need everyone out those doors there. Uh,